Hello and welcome back. Today in unit and taking a look at the various attributes that the NUnit framework provides us and how they're actually used and helpful in allowing us to create tests. The first attribute we want to take a look at is probably the most important attribute in NUnit. It's a test fixture attribute. This actually tells that this class is a test class and anything inside of this class is potentially a test. This needs to be put on all classes that you want to test. And taking a look that the method is also public, this is also very important as well. All test methods, all test classes need to be public. The second most important and second most used attribute is test. Let's go ahead and create our method real quick, some test. The test attribute tells the unit framework that this method is to be considered a test method will actually be something that's ran when you're running your test. This is the only attribute that actually allows a method to be show, shown inside the test unit ID. Take, take a look that I also created this method as public void. This is very important. All test methods must be public void and take an empty parameter. That's because this is begun, going to be run via reflection. This is the way it has to be done in order for it to work correctly. Once we get past the, the big two, as I like to call them, we have a few other attributes that we would like to look at. They're less used, but they're equally as important. The first one I want to look at is text fixture setup. Text fixture setup. Let's go ahead and create my method real quick. Test fixture setup is actually an attribute that says call this method prior to running the test inside of my test class. So let's, let's say for example I want to run this test. Prior to this test being executed, the logic inside of this method would actually be executed. So let's just create a you know, value, just break point later on and prove the point. To go with the test fixture setup, they've also created us a test fixture teardown. Teardown does the exact opposite. It's called at the very end of the test run. This will only be called once per test class or test fixture. These two are good for creating like maybe global data that you want to use for all of your tests or maybe use for you know, records in a database or doing some prep work and teardown work. These are very useful. Keep in mind they'll only be run once per session. But if you want something that's going to be run prior to and post every individual test run, the NUnit framework provides you that as well. Called setup. Setup is actually going to be run prior to every individual test run. So let's go ahead and create a method called setup, and I'm going to put, create a variable in here just as so I can put a breakpoint in a few minutes. So let's say let's take this test and let's actually duplicate it so we can have two of them. We have some test one and some test some test. If I want to run both of these. This would be run twice. This one would only be run once. Like the test fixture setup had teardown, setup has teardown as well. So if I can put that attribute on there. Teardown is pretty similar to test fixture teardown, with the exception, of course, it gets called post every individual test. Setup and teardown are very useful. They're similar to the, but I find these to be a little more useful because it allows me to, to create data on a more granular level or destroy and create objects on a more granular level. One thing I like to use the teardown for is for like my inversion of control containers. If I'm doing things with mocking, I need to reset up my teardown or my IOC container after every test. But you can also use this for say deleting data that you just created or maybe destroying objects or files or whatever after every test. Basic cleanup mechanism. Let's go ahead and actually just put breakpoints on these and actually just run these tests just to kind of see how they actually work. So I'm going to go ahead and compile. We're going to hop over to our NUnit IDE. If you're not familiar with how to use NUnit, uh, your screencast as I kind of go over this in more detail. What I want to prove here is if I attach my debugger to the NUnit IDE, 
I want to actually step into this and see how, what the order of execution is. Some test, click run. You notice that my fixture setup did get called first, first thing that happened. I now expect my setup to get called and sure enough it does. And last but not least, it should actually step into my test method. So this is kind of proving that, hey, I'm able to step into each of those things and see how they work. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few of the other attributes that I like to use commonly. All the other attributes that I'm going to talk about today are actually based off of or just must go with the test attribute. So the first one I want to look at is the ignore. Let's just give it because. It actually tells the end unit framework, it says, hey, don't run me. Don't run me ever. Don't, don't run me unless I explicitly tell you to run me later, but I'll have to remove the tab. If you're using something like the end unit framework, IDE, if you're using something like ReSharper or testdriven.net, you can actually still run these, but they won't get ran with the continuous integration. The ignore attribute is powerful because maybe you want to slap this on tests that you're still working on and you don't want your CI process to pick these up. Maybe these are just test, you know, testing your own code, but they're not real unit tests. Maybe you're just using a, a driver for writing code. Go ahead and give this. So let's do, I want to create a simple assert just so I can actually prove that this is not actually called via the unit ID. I'm going to bounce back over. My sum test method is the one I slap the attribute ignore onto. If I click run, it's yellow. It doesn't even actually attempt to, to run my test. And you'll know that this should have actually failed. So this tells me that I saw yellow. Remember in, in test driven or using any test driven uh, frameworks, green means good, yellow means potentially wrong or just didn't run, and red means something failed. The next, attri next attribute I want to take a look at is the explicit. And the explicit attribute is very similar to the ignore attribute, but it has a slight little twist. Let me go ahead and copy and paste this in so again I can see how this prove this is gonna fail. What the explicit attribute actually does ignore me, similar to the ignore attribute except for when I explicitly ask for you to be run alone. So let's go back over to end unit. Let's take a look and see how that works. So I'm going to run my entire suite here. You'll notice that the one that has the ignore attribute right here actually shows up as yellow as being ignored. However, my sum test one with my explicit attribute shows up as gray. Gray means it wasn't even ran. The end unit IDE just or end unit completely skipped over it and moved on. Now this is very useful for maybe integration style test where you don't want to run via your CI environment because maybe it's too long running and you don't want to create multiple test runs. Or if you're actually working on it like uh, you're in the middle of writing that test and you don't want it to run in your, your suite to go ahead and use the explicit. Be very careful when using either the explicit or the ignore because it's an easy way to hide your errors or hide your flaws. If you have a test that breaks, don't slap an ignore or an explicit on it. That's just hiding the, hiding the, hiding your mess, and it's not going to help you in the long run. It's actually going to kind of defeat the purpose of writing tests. The last attribute I want to talk, talk about today is the category. This is actually one of my favorites. Let's just go ahead and create out. I'm going to be lazy here and I'm going to copy and paste this, this test up here and just rename it. What the category attribute does the end unit framework to allows you to, within the end unit framework, organize your test. So if I have, let's just, for argument's sake, let's actually create multiple categories. I can create categories that are maybe long running tests. I can create them that are module based. I can give them any any you know name I choose, and it's a way to group group like test. What's really slick about this is if I go over to the, I can swap over to this categories tab 
you'll see that I have my category one and my category two. And again, I can create as many of these as I want. This actually allows me to only run in a category of tests. So maybe you have a, a suite of integration tests. And I'll see the integration test. I could actually choose it, say add and run. It would only run the test within that category. You can actually signify the category, specify the category at the command prompt as well. Say you're using cruisecontrol.net and you want to actually run you know, your, your non-integration test in one run and then your integration test in another run. You can do so by giving, it, by giving those tests the category attribute and telling it the command prompt, run just category integration or you know, unit. So let's kind of review the, the various attributes we've looked at today. Test fixture. This is the main attribute for the end unit framework. This actually tells the framework that this class here, which must be public by the way, test. The test attribute is the most important next to the fixture. And this actually says this method is a test method. So it allows the end unit framework to peer into it and actually run the logic inside of it. We've looked at the ignore. Very similar in nature. The only difference is ignore will actually never run. It will always turn yellow. Explicit will only run when you actually tell it to run that one single test. We've taken a look at the category attribute, basically a way to allow you to group. We've taken a look at the test fixture setup and test fixture teardown. These are attributes you throw on methods where you, you want actions to be run one time for the entire test fixture, both prior to and post all your tests being run actually methods to be called prior to and post every individual test you'd actually use a setup in the test. so I hope we learned something today about the attributes in the future going forward explore how to use these and use them with great power and great will till next time